As China's leader launches a campaign to strengthen the Communist Party, much of Xi Jinping's rhetoric is resembling that of Chairman Mao's. I'm Deborah Khan. Joining me now is Yi Ching Wu, who's an assistant professor from the University of Toronto, joining us now by telephone. Okay, Yi Ching, there's been a lot of talk around this new leftist movement in China. What does that mean today? Yeah, that's an interesting question. The new leftist movement is something is a movement that emerged in the late 1990s, and it's a significant number of people who have been dissatisfied with the direction that China is going in terms of all sorts of social economic problems, such as you know social economic inequality, uh, corruption, environmental problems, so on and so forth. So the new leftists they uh, look toward the the legacy of the Chinese Revolution. Uh, the 20th century Chinese revolution in general and the Mao era in particular, and particularly the value of equality as sort of a, a, a kind of a critical category uh, for criticizing the present. Okay, and so that's Xi Jinping, general. Uh -huh. right, and Xi Jinping's father was a revolutionary hero who was jailed by Mao. So is it particularly surprising that he would be adopting rhetoric that resembled Mao? It, it wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, this, this, the uh, Xi Jinping's adoption of the Maoist rhetoric, as much as Bo Xilai's adoption of the Maoist rhetoric and tactic, uh, I would say that has much less to do with their uh, family uh, history. I mean, the, the, the kind of, you know, the political attack their family or parents had suffered during the Mao era, uh, because many other people, numerous people had similar experience. Uh, but that had a lot to do with their political situation uh, of the ruling China's ruling group. Now, you know, they adopted Mao's tactic as a way, sort of, to uh, sort of to uh, to deflect criticism uh, or to to preempt and deflect criticism. I mean, especially for Xi Jinping. So Bo Xilai is gone, but Xi Jinping is smart to appropriate to invoke some of the some of the Mao's rhetoric, even though Bo Xilai is gone. So I think you know this is something that I mean, it's a political tactic. Okay, but w with China's economy developing so rapidly, wouldn't it make more sense today to modernize, um, so to speak, the political stance of of uh, the government to be more reformist? I yes, absolutely. I think that would make great sense to me. But on the other hand, the Chinese Communist Party derived its historical legitimacy from the. The Communist Revolution, of which Mao was a personal embodiment of that very history of the century long, I mean, of the half a century long Chinese Revolution. So the Mao era, the the the, the name and the person of Mao was the you know it embodied the legitimacy of the, uh, of the Chinese Communist Party. So periodically they need to you know the to 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 invoke different various aspects, highly selectively, of the 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 the, the legacy of Mao, just to I mean to reaffirm that legitimacy as well as a political tactic to, as I just mentioned, to, uh, to uh, deflect and uh, preempt criticism. But I think, you know, the, uh, the, the question of political reform that you mentioned is certainly that's something that's extremely important, but I'm not sure if that's something they're ready to do. Okay, thanks very much. Yi Ching Wu joining us from the University of Toronto on the telephone. For more on that story, you can go to WSJ.com. I'm Deborah Khan. You see that bloke? He's French. His name is Napoleon. A couple of hundred years ago, he made this extraordinary projection. China is a sleeping lion, and when she awakes, the world will shake. Napoleon got a few things wrong. He got this one absolutely right, because China is today not just woken up. China has stood up, and China is on the march, and the question for us all is where will China go? And how do we engage this giant of the 21st century? <laughs> well, and you're still here. <laughs> Welcome to the Centre for Independent Studies. My name is uh, Tom Switzer, and I'm the relatively new executive director here at CIS. For those of you who aren't aware of uh, CIS, we're a uh, public policy research organisation. We've been around for about 40 years and we're primarily committed to promoting free markets, small government, individual freedom, um, limited democratic government, and not least um, a civilised and open debate that goes beyond all the rancour and bitterness and toxic polarisation that all too often characterises public discourse in this country 
and around the Western world. You heard Kevin Rudd there. He identified, as Napoleon once predicted, that the lion is well and truly awake. Of course, how China shakes the world depends very much on its leadership of Xi Jinping, uh, who is clearly China's strongest leader since Mao Zedong from the revolution in 1949 to Mao's death in 1976. So what are the intentions of Xi Jinping? In April, just a few weeks ago, he led his party's Politburo to focus on the Communist Manifesto. Of course, that was the 1848 pamphlet published by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Subsequently, Chinese state media played up Marx's purported contributions to Chinese prosperity. According to the communist flagship newspaper, the People's Daily, quote, while the West has descended into an era of uncertainty and instability, China's experience eloquently proves that Marxism has opened a pathway to the truth. Peking University hosted a World Congress on Marxism a few weeks ago, gathering more than 120 scholars from some 30 countries to, quote, to discuss, quote, Marxism and the human community of shared destiny. <laughs> that was a reference to Xi's signature diplomatic slogan. Meanwhile, propaganda officials have produced videos and comics that focused on Marx's personality and appearance, and state television just recently aired a two-part documentary titled Immortal Marx and a five-episode chat show, Marx Was Right. Now, all of this is astonishing for people who support the CIS. 30 years ago, <laughs> 30 years ago, Francis Fukuyama, about 30 years ago, Francis Fukuyama, the American academic, famously declared the end of history. And by that, he meant the end point of humankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western democracy and liberal capitalism. Well, someone never gave Xi Jinping the script. So what does all this mean in a week when our former ambassador to China, Jeff Raby, has called for Julie Bishop to resign as foreign minister as a, as a way of improving relations with Beijing, a week when the trade minister Steve Chobo visited China, the first visit by a federal minister in eight months, ending an apparent freeze by Beijing on visits by Australian ministers, and this was due to the fallout from claims of Chinese government interference in Australian politics. Well, help to get to the bottom of all this, I can't think of a more distinguished Australian-China watcher than our guest speaker here today. Uh, Rowan Callick has been uh, the Hong Kong correspondent for the Financial Review, uh, the Beijing uh, correspondent for the Australian newspaper. He is, for mind, uh, this country's leading intellectual and journalistic uh, commentator on all matters related to the Asia-Pacific affairs. He's also author of, most recently, Party Time, Who Runs China and How? That's by Black Ink Books. Uh, Rowan will address us for about 15 minutes. We'll have a conversation and we'll take questions after that. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rowan Callick. Thanks very much, Tom, and it's uh, great to be here at the Centre for Independent Studies. Um, I preface my remarks by, by one thing that's very important to establish. China, its history, its culture and its people is not identical with the party state about which I shall primarily talk. Very important to establish this, this fact. Uh, some people would like, uh, like it to be felt that the party incorporates everything to do with China, but it doesn't. Indeed, my personal view is that Chinese people are the most individualistic people in the world, maybe alongside Americans. So this is very different from the sort of view of many uh, Westerners who feel Chinese people like to be regimented. This is not true, actually. There are Chinese people in the audience I'm sure you do not like to be regimented. And uh, I, th I think uh, it's important to bear that in mind. I'm going to be speaking about a very different manifestation. Now, we've all watched in these last 18 months 
pretty well agog the shaking up of America. But closer to us, a far more significant, radical and enduring transformation has been underway. The nature and scale of Xi Jinping's ambition and the extent of his success in implementing it at home and increasingly internationally are breathtaking. China has in recent months written into both its Communist Party and national constitutions. Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. How this plays out for your career, your company and your country is of central importance. How to parse this Xi thought, his three hour speech at last October's five yearly party conference, uh, and I sat through the three hour speech in Ramin Dawei Tang and the uh, Great Hall of the People, um, gives the key text. Here it is, I carry it around with me. Um, and uh, uh, this contains the argument behind uh, Xi Jinping thought. Uh, those who seek to engage with China today need to read it seriously, if they are to be taken seriously. When Xi emerged as General Secretary in 2012, I saw him marching out with the... Um, nine in those days, with the other eight members of the Politburo Standing Committee. He came first. We weren't sure whether Li Keqiang would come first, but he came first. He was viewed as a consensus kind of guy, like his immediate predecessors. This proved totally wrong. Instead, she has destroyed all individual rivals, rival families, power blocks and factions. Uh, uh, a guy named Cheng Li uh, became for a while the central figure in, in uh, Sinology by brilliantly uh, identifying the two big factions, Tai Zedang, the sort of uh, people with red blood in the veins, and the Twin Pai, the uh, Youth League. And he saw that in, in all uh, peoples and party congresses, identifying who's with which faction, and there's the Shanghai clique, this is all meaningless now. It's completely pointless. Uh, she has completely destroyed uh, all those groups. Uh, he's now called by state media, helmsman of the nation. Songs praising him have uh, been performed uh, naturally with choreography. Uh, the new ubiquitous documentary feature film, Amazing China, which I, I saw uh, in March in Beijing, is chiefly about amazing Xi. No other leader is shown, and he is shown speaking to, I think, roughly 30 groups, all applauding him after his uh, guidance. Politics professor at Oxford, Stein Ringen, uh, wrote recently that under Xi's leadership, the People's Republic is coming into its own. Xi is promoting its model in the world as superior and delivery and problem solving to what is seen as dithering democracy. He believes in the mission of Chinese greatness in the world. The world looks to China and sees an economic giant, but the China they ought to see is a political giant. Xi's political project is audacious. Reagan calls Xi's uh, rule a controlocracy. So most people go about their daily lives as they please, provided they're able to accommodate to limitations on liberty. There is no single institution in China today that is not led by the party. Xi's China is thus supremely purposeful. In the new era, Xi wants China's economic heft to be reflected in international influence and respect and in a capacity to transform global institutions to better suit its own ambitions. Its population is traveling, studying, and investing globally, and she is assuring that population Beijing will promote them and protect them and their interests in full. The new era China is economically robust and increasingly sophisticated. His new economic team is orthodox and experienced. I don't believe we're going to see a sudden shift fiscally or monetarily. Uh, 
my favorite economic analyst of China, Arthur Krober, uh, uh, recently uh, said that China has entered a post-reform era. Those of us who wrote about China used to kind of have a template to measure the, the quality of leaders. How good were they at reform? How many reforms did they in introduce? He's saying that's now a pointless uh, question to ask. Krober also stressed that the management of China's economy is entirely subordinate to politics in this new era. For instance, the salaries of executives at the largest state companies, which are being merged rapidly to create national champions, are now linked to their efforts in, quotes, party building. Liu He, China's new uh, vice premier for economic policy, said recently, strengthening the party's overall leadership is the core issue. The greatest economic concern remains corporate debt, which is still growing against GDP, uh, and overall debt is reaching towards three times GDP. Um, uh, it's, uh, the IMF uh, says that 75% uh, of the increase in, uh, in uh, uh, debt in the world since the global financial crisis has come from China. So there are economists who believe this is unsustainable. Uh, the Chinese government is acknowledging it's, a, it's an issue. Whether they will uh, succeed in wrestling down that, we'll have to find out. Uh, but certainly, the GD GDP growth is being sustained by stimulus, so there's con the government is having to continue to pump money in in order to ensure that Xi Jinping's promise will be, will be successful, that the economy will double during this decade. So by 2020, the economy be twice the size it was in 2010. That means keeping growth above 6.5%, an unknowable amount inevitably misallocated. She is not as wedded as old school communists to ownership of the means of production. One of the Chinese characteristics of his socialism is that loyalty to the party matters more. Thus, almost all private companies in China, locally or foreign-owned, now contain party branches, which expect to be consulted on strategic business decisions. Leaders of corporate China have to tread a very careful tightrope to near the leadership and you get burned. Too far away and you're punished for being too far away. So, for example, uh, uh, a guy named Xiao, who was a billionaire who ran the Tomorrow Group, uh, this group had made a lot of money for leading party families through um, c clever stock manipulations. He was abducted by Chinese agents from uh, the um, Four Seasons uh, uh, apartment hotel in Hong Kong about 16 months ago, and we d no one knows what's happened to him. Then uh, last week, uh, the chairman of Ambang Insurance, Wu Xiaohui, another billionaire, jailed for 18 years for fraud. He was too far away. So one was, one was too close, one was too far. Uh, and we've seen um, uh, a guy named Xu Xiang, uh, another billionaire jailed for five and a half years for insider trading just yesterday. And uh, he was jailed for insider trading because uh, the government, or, or Xi Jinping, needed to punish people for what happened in 2015 when the stock market bubble burst. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was such a shock. She had previously uh, uh, put his name to uh, the, the view that um, uh, the uh, market would start to play a decisive role in the allocation of resources. We haven't heard anything of that since 2015, since the stock market collapsed. And she has returned to uh, uh, more traditional communist uh, orthodoxy over, over the role of the market since then. Um, his... Uh, unlike Deng Xiaoping, he doesn't really like the company of private sector leaders. 
There are three favorites, though. The leaders of BAT, BAT, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. These are the three online giants which are bestriding China and increasingly the, the rest of Asia and uh, probably the world. And so this Robin Lee, uh, Jack Ma and uh, Pony Ma. And so far, they're treading, the, they're treading that, uh, that line pretty well. But none of them is too big to fail. None of them, so Jack Ma even, uh, if he were to walk too far away, get too close, Xi Jinping can easily dispense with Jack Ma. Alibaba could be dispensed with. Um, Urbanisation is a very input is in, in, is still driving growth, but in in a new way. Uh, she is seeking to direct exiting farmers towards the second tier and third tier cities. He's personally supervising the creation uh, near Beijing of Shang'an uh, as a huge new green clean high tech city. I went there. Um, not long ago in March, I went there to have a look because I'd actually seen Shenzhen when that was a small town. I'd seen Pudong uh, the, uh, from Puxi, the, from Shanghai, when it was just a few warehouses. Uh, if anyone's been to China in Shanghai, you can see Pudong now. A little bit different. And I think Shang'an will be like this. Um, she wants to restrain the growth of the biggest municipalities, shaking out from them already, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of Diduan, lower class people who lack hukos, permanent registration documents for those cities. Large numbers were driven out from Beijing last December, only allowed to take what they could carry. Their homes were bulldozed. Imagine if that had happened in Israel or the United States. Someone would have taken notice, but I, sus I did write a, a quite a long piece about it for the, with, for the Australian, Australian, but I suspect most people in the room would never have heard of this. Um, he's taking strong steps to reverse China's massive degradation of air, soil and waterways. Very popular move. And Beijing's clearer air last winter won him much applause, including for me. I was living there. China's new era will remain globally engaged. Uh, it is, for instance, in November, hosting its first great import expo in Shanghai. And the Made in China 2025 project is developing domestic capacity in all key tech centers. China spends more on importing semiconductors every year than it does oil, even. Um, uh, so this is one of the reasons why it's trying to uh, build its own totally autonomous high-tech sector. The risk, of course, is that it will break the great Asian value chain, which we've seen uh, reinforce uh, peace and collaboration in our region. I don't know what's going to happen with that. His new era is one of centralization of decision-making, restructured, around party commissions, such as on security and on the internet, six of which he personally chairs. There is no separation of powers in China. He's just dragged a lot of important areas from government to direct party control. He's installing a national supervisory commission to extend to every government official the purge within the party of rivals and of disloyalty under the formal goal of anti-corruption that has delivered him I believe uh, Tom mentioned uh, he's the most powerful person since Mao. I think he has more power than Mao had uh, because he can, he's got online power as well. As an unintended consequence, though, the anti-corruption campaign has broken up many networks of trust that had driven business activities for decades. He is sincere. He is not a pragmatist or a realist. He has a relentless work ethic and has taken over day-to-day -day direct direction of every important policy area. In the short term, he identifies China's three tough battles, preventing financial risks, reducing poverty and inequality, and tackling pollution. Popular goals. He's helped transform the internet in the name of cyber sovereignty in a tool, into a tool of control. In the real world, each 200 Chinese households are to be monitored closely by a security manager, 
by the grid management system. And this is being paralleled in the virtual world by the new social credit system, whereby people who jaywalk, smoke on trains, sign petitions, post too many critical items online and so on, will, uh, will be noticed. In, in, uh, on the street, they will be tagged by CCTV and by great facial recognition software, and they may be banned from travelling, forbidden state jobs, denied promotion and so on, while those who act worthily will gain advantaged green channel access to jobs, travel and leisure. The massive media coverage in the West of Mark Zuckerberg's defence of Facebook's record on privacy marked a big divide from China, where all such online providers, the first line of censorship, must be responsive to the authorities. As we heard from Tom, China's intellectual direction is clearly determined in this new era. Many universities have recently opened Xi Jinping thought centers. And uh, here's a thought, N none overseas yet. So I don't know why Australian universities have been so backward in this area, <laughs> but if they really, really want to uh, build those partnership and uh, grab an extra 10,000 students from China, this is the way to do it. A Chinese professor friend who teaches at Fudan, the top university in Shanghai, uh, told me recently that when she entered her usual lecture room at the start of this year, no less than seven cameras had been installed in it, viewing and recording each lecture, each student's response. China led, we, we heard the global celebrations of the bicentenary of Karl Marx's birth. And she said, um, Marxism would always be a powerful ideological weapon to change the world. He's placed the state administration of religion directly under the party's United Front Work Department, which is also responsible for ensuring the loyalty to Beijing of overseas Chinese. He said the practice of all religions must be sinocized. He has quashed domestic dissent very successfully with most human rights lawyers who acted as intermediaries for people with grievances uh, now in jail or uh, disbarred. A uh, huge raid happened uh, three years ago. 275 people were and their uh, staff were arrested and they're taken out. Um, so we don't hear m much from people, people with grievances. Uh, one big success. Also, China's embryonic civil society, which briefly flourished uh, in the wake of the Sichuan earthquake, as I saw a decade ago, um, is also in retreat. Half a million Uyghurs, people in Xinjiang, have been detained in new re-education camps opened in Shen Xinjiang in just a year. Fantastic organisation, 500,000 people. Uh, taken out from their homes and put into uh, camps. Uh, a further former source of vulnerability for the party, the middle class, has instead become especially loyal as it's received crucial economic rewards, uh, including, including through access to state assets. But as prosperity becomes more routine within China, she is needed to identify a fresh channel of legitimacy for party rule, China's international prestige which can be audited readily by all those Chinese in interfacing with the world. And this is uh, being hinged off or being weaponized by the economic independence, interdependence through which China has become the number one partner in trading goods of most of the world. Last year, uh, indicating the change confidence about going out combined with some anxieties in China, a patriotic Chinese Rambo-style movie, Wolf Warrior II, smashed box office records. The film's slogan is, whoever offends China will be punished, no matter how far they are. She has modernized the People's Liberation Army, restructuring its command to reflect capabilities and not geographical areas, cutting its size by 300,000 to 200, 2 million, while it establishes overseas bases in, one, in Djibouti, the first, and patrols distant oceans, uh, uh, exercising in the Baltic Sea uh, earlier this year, as China's dependency on Middle East oil grows. 
China's fleet is now bigger than America's in sheer numbers. That's not to say China would win a war at sea, but she is boosting massively China's diplomatic resources. Since 2013, its foreign affairs spend has almost doubled, while last year the White House cut such US spending by 30%, 30%. And uh, in a new statement on foreign affairs uh, this week, the Central Committee issued a statement quote, quoting Xi as talking, as calling for enhancing a centralized and unified leadership uh, of the Central Committee over foreign affairs and opening up the prospects of major country diplomacy with Chinese characteristics. So you hear his phrase, uh, his own thought coming into, th coming into this. Uh, that statement referred to other people, but no mention of the foreign minister, will you? Uh, Xi has uh, uh, established China's first aid agency, tasked to better serve China's diplomacy and the Belt and Road Initiative. In September, every African leader will fly to Beijing for the second Africa-China Summit, underlining whose power wields most influence in that cont continent. He was applauded wildly by the international da elite at Davos, and uh, he's uh, succeeded in having the UN's Human Rights Council accept as its new template this community of shared future, supplanting the former adherence to universal values and instead affirming each government's interpretation of rights in its own country. The co-sponsors of Chinese motion included Syria, Cambodia, Venezuela, and Pakistan. Uh, his Belt and Road is a geopolitical masterstroke, acting as a great magnet for countries short of capital and infrastructure. The process of badging projects remains challenging for foreign firms to access. Um, in certain strategic cases, as massive loans prove unsupportable and as China's, as I said, dependence on Middle East oil grows, Beijing has begun to forgive the debt but assume the assets, such as ports in key locations, including Sri Lanka and the Maldives. Uh, a recent paper pointed to 16 countries especially vulnerable to excessive loans. She is personally popular, powerful and effective. He's a healthy-looking 64, and having broken the limits on personal power introduced after Mao by Deng Xiaoping, he may well continue ruling for a further 20 years or more. Look at Mahathir. He's <laughs> only just getting out going at 92. In 20 years, uh, she will be a youthful 84. Uh, no successor being groomed. Chinese people are naturally, and I'm not saying this ironically, and naturally and properly proud of what China has achieved. So long as she continues to score successes, they will be grateful. But sinologist Andrew Nathan warns, if he stumbles, they will turn on him. I must stress there's no hint of that so far, but the centralization of personali and personalization of Xi's rule does create risks for the party. As a postscript, I'd add that for all the enhancement of the party's Controlocracy in this new era, era, unintended consequences proliferate. Thus, the Belt and Road is also becoming a silk road along which Chinese churches are sending Christian missionaries to evangelize Central Asia, the Middle East and Africa. Our world is changing in extraordinary ways. Pay close attention in particular to Xi's new era. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. It's interesting because not so long ago the overwhelming consensus among China watchers was that communism had ceased to be the central legitimating idea of state power and now China is becoming ever more so authoritarian. In the 80s and the 90s and even after the Chinese integration into the World Trade Organization in the early 2000s, the overwhelming prevailing wisdom was that the more that China became capitalist and more prosperous, the more likely China would become li more liberal and democratic, a bit like Taiwan and South Korea. Uh, what makes China so different? Yeah, I th uh, first of all, I say this is a very 
this is a big problem, this view, because it, it's led to this feeling amongst some people in, in the West, including in some polities like in uh, Capitol Hill in America, that China has kind of let them down. We expected, you know, as you guys uh, started to drive cars and live in skyscrapers, that you become like us. Sort of, how come you're not? Uh, and while Korea, Taiwan, Japan uh, are certainly uh, living democracies, they're not entirely like the United States. And uh, you know, Japan isn't un-Japanese because it's modern and so on. So that's the, f the first thing I'd, I'd say about that. And also I'd say that uh, China is a little bit different because uh, uh, there's a sense of continuity in what the party is doing. The, uh, China's history has been one of d dynastic imperial rule. And Chinese people didn't used to be called Chinese people. They used to be called in the Qingren and Mingren. So you are named for the family of the dynasty in, in whose uh, place you were living. Mm. And so we see the party, um, even though Mao, of course, uh, and the Civil War and the uh, Cultural Revolution, so uh, attempting to make a complete break, we haven't really seen a change in this uh, ambition of the party to become, to retain, even though it doesn't choose to exercise always, but to retain the right to be pervasive. This is what makes uh, today's China and the par Chinese party very different from any other party in the world. It's unique. In March last year, the foreign minister, Julie Bishop, was in Singapore and she declared that China can't truly really be a regional player or regional leader unless it becomes a democracy. Your response? Uh, uh, first of all, I'd say mm, I don't know why she said it publicly because <laughs> it's kind of not going to happen <laughs> <laughs> or anytime soon. And I, I, so I don't really know why, sh why she actually chose to say that. I don't think it's You right. could argue, though, that from China's perspective, yeah. there's a real fear of things getting out of control. If you put China's uh, development in the context of the last century. They've had invasion, civil war, mass terror, revolution, um, you know, poverty. Uh, isn't there a great fear that things could get out of control if you don't, if you decentralise power at a rapid rate? This is the, this is what authoritarians always say, of course. Uh, many Indonesianists, as I know, because I, as you said, I it was Asia Pacific, editor of the Finn and the Oz, you know, used to and say... next week marks the 20th anniversary of the fall of Saharo. It's just exactly what I was going to say. So uh, I was very familiar with uh, Australian Indonesianists saying, uh, after Suharto, uh, Indonesia, a very diverse country, would fall apart. But instead what we've seen is Indonesia actually has... Uh, the average rate of economic growth has picked up since Suharto died. Mm -hmm and uh, remains a, well, it's a cha challenged place, but it's, it's cohesive. So, so was Indonesia a role model for China then, in terms of embracing <laughs> democracy? I, I, I'm loath to say that, it <laughs> that China is a, a sort of place that's very willing to accept uh, role models. There are many Chinese people, though, who uh, actually do like the idea of democracy. Uh, Donald Trump, not unpopular in China, mm. partly because he was seen to defy expectations and to be someone completely outside the elite. Um, people who say that you know Chinese people are s somehow sort of um, uh, racially, if I can use this word, uh, predestined for authoritarian rule uh, can look at Taiwan and see a very lively uh, democracy. So I, I'm not convinced that that's the case. But as we see, uh, as you say, it was a disastrous 20th century for most Chinese individuals and families. I really understand how it would be that many Chinese people 
have actually looked to the family, so they're not even looked to f style of government. They're looking to their family as their, s their source of stability and meaning in life, and they want a, a, an external stability in which the family can prosper as their main aim. Now, not everyone shares the view that China's rise will continue unabated and that uh, Xi is imposing more authoritarian power and that it will be long-lasting. David Shambar, who's one of America's most distinguished China watchers, He's from George Washington University. He's actually predicted the coming Chinese crack-up. And his argument is that Xi's despotism is severely stressing China's system and society, bringing it to breaking point. Uh, Professor Shambar goes on to say the demise is likely to be, quote, protracted, messy and violent, and Xi himself could be deposed in a power struggle or coup. Rowan, is Professor Shambar's thesis plausible? Uh you know, uh, uh, in the long run, you know, we're all dead. I don't, <laughs> but in the short run, no, it, it about can't Mark's be true. not Keynes today. Yeah, <laughs> so that's right. Uh, look, I have to doff my hat to Shambo. He's written this, remains the standard uh, academic work on the party, but I don't think so. Uh, uh, one of the, uh, the ways in which uh, she... Uh, controls what's happening in China is everything online, everything um, uh, in the real world uh, is can be controlled from Zhongnanhai, from the uh, party headquarters. Uh, it's, it, I would say it's not almost impossible, impossible to organize uh, uh, a meaningful uh, counter group. There is no faction left inside the party. Um, last October, at the end of the party conference, and I, I stood there looking on the stage, and it was the entire power elite of, of China's there. You know, Deng Xiaoping's son was on the stage, the one who was, uh, lost the use of his legs when he was thrown out of the window by the Red Guards. And all those people were there, you know, Zhu Rongji and so on. Um, Many of those people I could see, I could imagine the bubbles out of their heads were thinking, we really do not like this guy. We really do not like him. But we all have to stand together because they, s they looked at what happened in uh, 1990 in Russia and they've decided that the Soviet Union fell partly because of what was happening inside. And uh, so these families are still the rulers of China, the 89 million members of the party, or the, the particularly these families. And so they just stood there and she was in the middle. Kind of uh, had a dismissive look on his face as if I don't need to be here because I'm still the boss. I think it's very hard for people to uh, organize against him. But there is this point of vulnerability that he has taken, China is not a federation, it's the only place a state of this size in the world that's not a federation. And uh, so you're in the same time zone everywhere. It's just as it was in the imperial era. And she has taken decision making. It's a complex country into his own hands to a degree that uh, can he make consistently good decisions uh, in all these areas of life mm. for the entire nation, uh, centralized, personalized, without stumbling. What happens if there is a uh, run on a bank and China goes into recession? Well, China won't be destroyed, immolated, you know, any more than America was destroyed by the GFC. The Chinese economy will go on, will continue to be meaningful. But people may start to raise questions. Uh, how that can lead to political change, mm -hmm. I don't know. But the party is, I think, unknowingly thrown the dice in they didn't know who they were choosing mm -hmm. but to him and he is now everything is wrapped up in him and i think it's a danger well let's turn to china's regional ambitions under xi because since he's been in power in 2012 china has bulked up and built these artificial islands in the south china sea you mentioned the one belt one road initiative in 2015, the China-led Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank was created as a rival to the World Bank and to the Asian Development Bank. And I want to run a quote by you. This is from Kishore Mabubani, who's been a, a past guest here at CIS. He's a future guest at CIS. He'll be coming to the Concilium uh, that we run every year. This is what he talked about when um, Britain and uh, many other countries like Australia had to deal with this issue. Um, the US can no longer dominate world history. A new power has also arrived. 
The British, like most other middle powers, have decided to hedge their bets and work with China as well as the US. But this is also a matter of survival. If London does not serve the financial and economic interests of a rising China, it could become sidelined in the 21st century. Hence, the British have no choice but to work with China. Now, of course, this came at a time when Tony Abbott and Joe Hockey and Julie Bishop were subjected to all sorts of uh, pressure from Washington not to become part, not for Australia to become part of the China-led Asian Infrastructure Bank. We supported China and we opposed the Americans. Is Kishore Mar Marbulbani on the money? Uh, well, I th uh, I'm reluctant to say, I think on this he's partly right. He was the, one of the theologians behind Asian values debate uh, earlier, which I, I didn't agree with at all. But uh, on this, he's, uh, I think he's partly right. And uh, it's interesting, particularly in parenthesis, I'll say the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank has proven to be not a, a rival to, as you said, to the World Bank not and yet. ADB. They've actually, Jin Li Chun has run it, who runs it, uh, has actually done quite a good job at making it a complementary type of body. And it, in, indeed, he's not, uh, he's, he's not used it. He could have bulked it up very quickly by Belt and Road loans, but he, he, which is, th those are mostly geopolitical. He's chosen not to and has been economically quite orthodox. So AIIB, an example maybe against what I've been saying, that of a, of a China working in a complementary way. So China uh, can be doing this. One of the questions, though, is we can, yes, we, we should, must work with China. This is a very important place, 1.3 billion people. Uh, it must be uh, respected, given room. But do we have to concede everything to China's own demands or requests? Well, I think not necessarily. And I think China doesn't actually respect uh, passivity and, uh, and so on, and uh, people who automatically concede ground. So I think w we need to have a more nuanced uh, relationship, knowing how China works, knowing its ambitions, not agreeing with how China treats its minorities and uh, 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 and so on, but uh, understanding that we have to work with yeah. it. People are obviously nervous about the rise of China and the strategic consequences. Uh, Graham Allison, a distinguished scholar at Harvard University, has written this book called The Thucydides Trap, and he makes the point that uh, you know global stability will be shaped by how the world's established power accommodates the rising power that replaces it. And he's done the statistics that since 1500, of the 15 cases where this transition of power has taken place, 11 times the result was a war. Will we confound history this time if indeed China surpasses the United States as the region's predominant power? So one of the things that uh, uh, leaders in China uh, often say or always say is China is a peaceful rising power. They say China has never taken over territory from anyone else and so this is not right of course um, <laughs> so this has happened quite recently but if you you can look at the maps and see how that's changed but nevertheless china is a lo uh, Zhu Feng, a friend of mine an academic now at nanjing he, he described china to me as a lonely rising power so uh, it's actually kind of got its back to the wall some of the 14 nations on its land borders but the only friend it's got if you like is North Korea which is ruled by uh, uh, Kim Jong-un uh, who's caught and to give you a clue as to just what Chinese people think about uh, Kim Jong-un he's commonly known as Jin Sampang uh, fatty Kim the third in uh, <laughs> Chinese so <laughs> so not much res respect there, but of course they're, they're talking together at the moment, they have to get by. So uh, will China uh, start to exercise uh, a desire for territorial uh, spread? Actually, I think by what had happened under the, in the latter Qing era, uh, moving into uh, Xinjiang in the West mm, uh, and Tibet, China actually has that room for growth, if you like. I, I don't want to take this too far. I don't want to compare China with 
uh, Germany in the 20s and 30s, but you know, Germany wanted to find room to expand. And of course, China's population is not expanding at the moment. The working population is starting to decline. So it's got the room that it wants, it, but it, it does want to be able to um, actually, uh, it, it, this is crucial. It feels that security is bound up with the world of ideas as well. This is kind of what makes a difference. So it wants the people around to have the same ideas, think the same way. And uh, this is where the problems start to uh, occur, I think. And op opinion in the West is divided about the rise of China. You have some people like John Howard who makes the point that we shouldn't be surprised by China's rise. All great powers, whether they're democratic or authoritarian, uh, as their power increases, their definition of national interests grows with it, and they start mm. to seek a sphere of influence in areas on which their prosperity and stability depend. Howard's argument is we shouldn't overreact to China here. It's merely exhibiting all of the tendencies of a new great power who has fairly recently arrived on the scene. But of course, um, several prominent liberal and conservative American intellectuals would disagree. Here's uh, a quote here from Robert Kagan. He's a prominent neoconservative uh, who was a guest here at CIS several years ago. Uh, he summed up the Pax Americana strategy of the post-Cold War era. I want to get your reaction to this, Rowan. Quote, my attitude toward China is you do well economically, but you can't use your military to expand your power position in the region. Is that fair? No. Is there any justice to that? No. We get the Monroe Doctrine, which was the, the US doctrine in the 19th century that justified a sphere of influence in Latin America. We get a Monroe Doctrine. You Chinese don't. That's just the way it is. I'm sorry. We're containing China, and the Chinese believe we are containing them. What do you make of Robert Kagan's argument? So the, uh, yeah, the, so the Americans uh, have obviously been the guardians of uh, trade routes around the world in the last few decades, under which we have prospered and China has prospered as well. So now China is uh, raising questions about whether it wants to take over that kind of a role, or whether it just wants to be able to break free, as they say, from through the first island chain around Asia and uh, move freely in the world. They've, they're constructing a, a blue water navy. They've got a blue water navy already. They've got one aircraft ca carrier. But the question one. here is, how do they respond to the United States and its allies in the region if they're beefing up its military presence in the region and China is rising? Surely this can't end well. Uh, there's a difference between the rise of, uh, of nations before what we I talked about, the, the value chain. And I think before uh, economic globalization, countries mostly were manufacturing in, in their own borders and so on. Now, uh, there's a greater integration of uh, world trade and economies. Times have uh, times have changed, I think. Yeah, and economic even interdependency means yeah. the lessens the chance of war. Uh, that's what I, that's what I Do believe. You know, Europe was very interdependent uh, in the 1910s, and uh, no Norman Angel wrote a famous thesis called uh, the the, um, the World Peace or something like that, and he won a Nobel Peace Prize. And his argument was: the more interdependent Europe was, the less likely they'd go to war few years later you had a great war. One of the things that uh, uh, people I think wrongly presume is that uh, the countries around China don't have in, uh, their own thoughts on this and uh, they do. So, And they're kind of hedging their bets. It's not that we're all lining up. Uh, which side are you on? Are you pro-China or pro-America. Uh, you know, the, the Japanese now, Shinzo Abe is saying, well, we will probably join the, uh, the bank, we'll join the Belt and Road. And uh, Modi recently had a big meeting with, um, with Xi Jinping. It's, they're not going to go all the way with Xi, but they're going to uh, want a, a reasonable relationship. Obviously, we're still learning the extent, because as I was saying, she is seeking legitimation through internationalization. We're not entirely sure that we've got to the end of what what he wants and how much control he wants. Uh, so the 
the nine dash line around the South China Sea is, is this the end uh, of that process or is this just the yeah. beginning? If it's the end of the process, probably the answer is, actually, we can wear it. Uh, but if this is just the start, if it goes towards, say, invading Taiwan, that's a very different question. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's then that's that's a shock to everyone, and I think will lead to the downfall of the party in China. Well, let's wrap it up with Australia before we go to questions. Uh, I mentioned before in my introduction our former ambassador to Beijing, uh, Jeff Raby, whom you know well. Uh, he took to the opinion pages of the Financial Review this week, and he called on the Foreign Minister Julie Bishop to either be, to either resign or be sacked as a way of improving relations with Beijing. This is what he said uh, in the Financial Review. I won't read the entire quote. Uh, but this is Jeff Raby in the Financial Review. Um, the Australian Foreign Minister Julie Bishop has not visited China in more than two years. She angered China by making the most strident public comments on the South China Sea of any foreign minister. And last year, as I mentioned before, uh, she said that China was not fit for regional leadership. Australia needs a foreign minister who is steeped in history and geopolitics, who lives and breathes the issues, and who has a grasp of the profound challenges we face in the rapidly evolving new world order being shaped in large measure by China. Rowan, what do you say about he's, your friend he's Ambassador He's saying Rabin? two things. It's, there's two halves. So I can agree with him. We need a, a foreign minister who uh, understands these things. Uh, but the first part doesn't always, doesn't necessarily uh, bear out what he's saying. Does that mean automatically a foreign minister who understands the region is going to, his presumption is, uh, agree with what uh, with China's own aims and ambitions. I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I don't think China were even uh, expecting that to happen. I think this is a problem. And Jeff is an example. Uh, he, he's a very intelligent guy, a very good economist, and so on. But this kind of message actually works very well being played back into China. This is what people call message washing. So uh, that message Mm, it, it caused a little stir here, but uh, in China, more useful. Yeah, this will have been used, beamed back into into China to say, former ambassador says... Blah, blah, so. What upsets China too are the accusations uh, levelled by Canberra and many media outlets that the Chinese are interfering in our domestic politics. Sure. And that's why there's an apparent freeze on Australian ministers going to Beijing, at least until this week with Steve Chobo's visit. Yeah, we don't know whether... There is a freeze. There, there are other reasons why. Uh, with I mean, with the series of meetings, our relationship yes. with China hasn't been this bad oh, yeah. since the early seventies. Well, oh no, I don't know. No, I think well, well, since the late eighties. Uh, well, with under Kevin Square. Rudd, p things were pretty <laughs> bad actually. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and right. just between us, what the, did he call the Chinese? We won't mention it. The then Chinese ambassador <laughs> okay. used to ring me up, and uh, this is true. And. Uh, I picked up the phone one day and he said, you wouldn't believe what he's just said. I said, oh, Mr. Ambassador, <laughs> calm down. It's all right. It'll be all right. <laughs> no, we won't go there. Okay, now it's time for Q&A. And our first question comes from Jackson Kwok. He's from uh, China Matters. Yeah, we'll just wait for the uh, microphone, Jackson. Jackson's from uh, uh, China Matters and he's just written a policy brief on Confucius Institutes in Australia. Oh. Thank, thank you for that introduction. Uh, my question isn't about Confucius Institutes. So. <laughs> um, so, Rowan, you've spoken extensively about the increasing control and restriction in China, but as we know, uh, increases in restriction tend to lead to pushback in some sense. Um, you mentioned a case in uh, last year in Beijing where uh, a number of a, uh, migrant workers were pushed out, evicted from their homes. Uh, a more recent example was uh, where Weibo, the um, Chinese version of Twitter uh, censored homosexual content, uh, which caused a lot of upset amongst uh, younger Chinese uh, citizens. Uh, in both cases, there was pushback from the middle classes there. My question is that although the Communist Party has been quite successful in co-opting the middle class, um, is Will Xi Jinping need to relax some of the control, or relax some of these restrictions to keep the, uh, keep the middle class uh, satisfied, in a sense? If so, what sort of restrictions will be relaxed, or what form will that take? Or do you think there's we can expect more of these instances of pushback, sometimes successful pushback from the middle class? Thank you. Yeah, uh, w that's a great question. And uh, a good another example of what you're talking about, you, you'd know 
better than me this uh, the death of um, a young uh, Chinese man uh, in northeast Beijing uh, uh, at the hands of police uh, caused uh, because he was uh, Rimin Dashwe was he I think he was there yeah and he this uh, uh, to my surprise uh, you know caused uh, a, m a huge number of uh, people to complain and uh, ab about uh, police uh, unnecessary brutality and so on. And uh, it became clear to me from seeing that, that what you're saying, that underneath people, uh, people are unhappy about degrees of control from time to time. I don't believe that Xi Jinping is the kind of guy to take many steps back, actually. Uh, but in, as in this case with the police, you know, there'll be attempts to take people to court, uh, find someone else responsible, uh, and and then just uh, hope that it blows away. I, d I think that um, he feels comfortable that he's on top of it, that Prosperity will, as long as prosperity continues, that it's uh, to improve. But the problem, I think, is also this middle class is increasingly un the new generation, people of your age, are less willing to ascribe uh, their prosperity to the party's good works and good deeds. M that might be seem ungrateful, <laughs> but uh, I, th I think people just feel uh, differently about it now and this uh, gives him less ammunition after Tiananmen many middle class people students were involved you know then middle class was cosseted and uh, became allies but now the he needs to find new ways and I agree that, that uh, China this is a facet of what I was saying at the start Chinese people are individualistic they uh, people who have self-respect, you know, people are um, unhappy with being treated poorly. But it's very difficult to understand any ways in which people can communicate this or uh, take it further. Uh, but this is why, as Andrew Nathan said, if there's a stumbling uh, which is palpable and everyone can see it, it may not, b it may not be the case that lots of people rally around and say you know, she is such a good guy, we really want to look after him. He has popularity in broader population, but probably less amongst people like that. Next question comes from Sue Windybank, uh, my CIS colleague and editor of our policy magazine. Uh, hi, Rowan. Uh, if I could just follow up that point you made uh, earlier about pushback and the diplomatic freeze and ask, to what extent do you think Clive Hamilton's recent book on Chinese influence in Australia has played into that? And whether you think that debate he's opened up about the degree of influence or attempted influence is a useful one in, as he says, focusing on the politics instead of the economic. I th yes, I, I think I welcome the book being written. I think uh, it's important to have this d debate. This is a democratic country. We should talk about things like this. And uh, it's, um, it's a very particular thing thing. Uh, I think Clive in some cases pushes his argument too far. I resent uh, on both sides. I've been away. I've only just come back to Australia uh, a few weeks ago. I kind of feel unhappy. You can hear my slightly English accent. I feel kind of unhappy about uh, uh, bad tempered debate and rudeness and I'd like to think we can, we can talk uh, mm, sensibly about these things. The party um, has this understandable nervousness about the diaspora because they've seen that uh, when, the, uh, when the Qing dynasty fell, Sun Yat-sen had uh, put a lot of, uh, spent a lot of time building uh, support amongst the diaspora, which played a, a handy part in bringing down the empire. Then, uh, in the late 80s, it's quite clear that the Gomindang military one-party rule in Taiwan uh, was pulled down not just because of Jiang Jingguo uh, feeling democratic, but because there was big pressure again from the Taiwan diaspora 
uh, to democratize and the DPP uh, it's in the embryonic state was uh, building support internationally. So there's a feeling that the Chinese diaspora, must we must ensure that those people are loyal. And then there's a possibility, do we want to go further than merely loyalty? Do we want to make sure that the, the diaspora are actually uh, helping us achieve uh, goals in internationally? And that's the kind of question that Clive's book, I think, raises. And you'd have to say, oh, this is a, a, a dull answer, but in part yes, in part no. And uh, so I think, yes, we, we, we need to be able to have debates like this. It, and uh, in a way, Australia is a kind of test case for China because we're the biggest uh, Western country in our part of the world, if you like, and uh, China, Chinese people have felt comfortable here. Many people have migrated, uh, studied, invested, and uh, have been rightly welcomed, have become great citizens of our country. And so people have felt, felt good about this, and I think other people in the community feel good about having Chinese people here. And so it's kind of uh, inevitable that uh, because of the depth also of the economic engagement, that, uh, well, let's see if we can, um, we can uh, uh, build, build on that to enable the, to us to become even more secure in terms of ideas so that the ideas circulating in Australia are consonant with the kind of ideas that, uh, that we have at Zhongnanhai that have been so successful in China. Uh, I, I can see that this is how things have, have moved. And we're asking questions about that now. Next question. Yes, sir. Yeah, John Connor. Um, you mentioned, you sp dwelt specifically on the growing politicization of all matters in China, including all the economic activity. Do you feel that inevitably that will lead to gross inefficiency? And in that regard, I'd refer specifically to the history of the Soviet Union, which during the 20s and 30s seemed to have extraordinary economic progress, but which eventually was brought undone by many things, but not least of which was the politicization of almost all economic decisions, ranging from Lucento genetics through to God knows what. Great question. I'm, I'm not an expert in the Soviet Union, so it's very hard to compare it. Uh, I do think there there are risks. So Wang Jianlun, the uh, owner of one, effectively the owner of Wan Da, the founder, China's richest man on and off, uh, had to kowtow recently and and say, um, we must accede to government directions uh, over where we invest, and so that's a kind of step in that direction, I suppose. If if uh, they're the company, by the way, that owns Hoyts. Uh, here is one of the things that they own. So in future, they uh, are being discouraged from uh, investing in the entertainment world overseas, which they were do doing, uh, spending a lot of millions on on this. So uh, opportunity, there's an opportunity cost at the moment. Is the furthest I go? Will this lead to what you're saying? Well, it could do. The extent of China's engagement with the world is far greater than the Soviet Union's. We have a lot of international companies working there. Their models and Chinese people are working for foreign companies, working for domestic companies, even though um, th there's a, a government say the, the scope is much more. Uh, Chinese companies are working overseas as well. They're bringing those types of understandings back to China. So. Unlikely, I think, but a good question. Next question. Um, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I'm a native Chinese, so I'd like to firstly applaud and congratulate Colvin for your very deep and the clarity your, of your understanding and observ observation of Chinese, especially those events uh, like how we call Korean leader Jin Sanpang. That's very funny, and uh, that, that shows <laughs> your deep understanding of the Chinese people. And another observ observation I saw that you, you made very clear in, your in the beginning of your speech that Ch Communist Party and the country are two separate entities. That is very important. So um, I just want to ask a question. Um, you said 
um, Chinese people, m many Chinese people are proud for the economic growth and the rapid change. How truthful that is, because as a native Chinese, I do work, watch very closely and maintain contacts with my friends and families over there. Um, from my observation and my contacts, I'm not too sure how many of you are aware of the uh, quit CCP movement. Just Google the word quit CCP. CCP means Communist Party. And Google the, the book or the video, non, nine commentaries of the Chinese, non, non, nine commentaries of the Communist Party. 300 million Chinese people have declared their withdrawal from the Communist Party. So Cohen, have you talked to any of these 300 million people? <laughs> and uh. So when, they, when, when Chinese people proudly claim something, that's because of fear. For, my s for example, when I s try to speak here, my, quest uh, my friend reminded me, be careful. If this is going to be filmed and my face put onto YouTube, <laughs> am I going to get trouble or my family or friends in China get trouble? I thought about it and I thought, I will trust you, you will not pu publish my face. So I'm going to speak. So those people who said proud, how truthful that is. So that's, that's basically my question. And for those 300, peop 300 million people, from my, my communication with them, what I hear is their observ observation is what Xi Jinping is doing now is actually the last resort. He tried to, make th tried to make the Communist Party to survive because from day one, when communism took power into China, the land of uh, uh, the land based on 5,000 5, years of divinely inspired culture, it has the crisis of survival on that culture. So over the past 60 years, the Communist Party under several leadership has always tried to survive. And now Communist Party is under a critical surviving edge. So Xi Jinping is doing whatever he can to make this party to keep going and survival. So now he's using his very extreme result to say, to run the propaganda, Mar Karl Marx is right. This is a very last resort. So many Chinese people are observing and, uh, and saying, we are going to soon welcome the collapse of Chinese well, there you China. Go. So there's David, David Shambar's question we raised yes, before. Yes, Rowan. Right. Well, thank you for your remarks. Look, I don't know what's in the mind of 300 million Chinese <laughs> people. It's very hard to know. A friend of mine, uh, you know, when I said to her, uh, we were talking in a city outside Beijing, uh, and she was a party member, she was going to the party congress, and I said, and she said, will she l seek to abolish term limits? And I said, people are saying that in Beijing. She hit her head on the table at the restaurant when, that, when she said that. But we really don't, part of the problem is we really don't know very much. We don't know how decisions are made. We don't know what happens in Jongnan Hai, what thoughts are, how much polling the party does, of what views people have. Uh, how much that's taken into account in decision making and changes. So uh, <coughs> this is what partly what makes uh, uh, writing about China fascinating for someone like me is actually we don't know very much uh, <laughs> <laughs> at, at that uh, decision making area because no one is uh, allowed into it. But I, I, I um, acknowledge what you're saying that there's great variety in views and uh, it's not while she will be saying, and many people, other people say, China is now in a new golden age. So we had the uh, Tang Dynasty, the Hai Qing, and now this is the new third golden era for China. Other people are saying, we're going back into the bad old dark days of Mao Zedong. So uh, there's big ranges. Look, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time, but uh, we will be having drinks afterwards and you can mingle with Rowan and ask him any questions you wish to ask before. CIS is very blessed to have a very distinguished board of directors and it's my great privilege to uh, introduce you to one of our board directors to give the vote of thanks to Rowan, James Phillips. Thanks, Tom, and thank you so much, Rowan. Um, my eldest son actually lives in Hamburg, which is at the western extremity of um, 
think, one, road. one road. Um, and the scale of um, what presumably is not just a logistical uh, ambition um, of, uh, of China in the one belt, one road um, uh, policy is really quite staggering and it will be very interesting to see how that travels and whether it will be um, a distraction. Uh, it's also interesting to think whether the implications of one road have perhaps made things a bit more difficult for the Uyghurs in the um, short term because um, uh, becoming so active in Central Asia must be one of the very interesting um, challenges that China is now facing. Anyway, that's just a, um, <laughs> one of about a thousand in, uh, comments we could make about that very interesting discussion and thank you so much. I think the um, uh, one of the key things obviously in uh, international relations is to have a deeper understanding of the other parties that we're dealing with and their uh, his history and aspirations and culture. And you've helped us uh, a bit on that journey this evening. So thank you so much, Rowan. Thank you all. Good. James, thank you. Thank you, James. Um, ladies and gentlemen, CIS uh, does not receive any tax dollars. We're proudly independent. We rely primarily on the support uh, from our members and donors. Uh, so if you enjoyed tonight, if it whets your appetite for serious public policy, please consider becoming a member. Our, our next event, uh, one to save, is June 19. Uh, former Prime Minister John Howard and I will be in here, similar sort of setup, where we'll have a conversation about our culture and threats to our liberal society. June 19, please come along. Tickets are selling fast. Um, hope to see you again, and thanks so much for being here. And thank you so much to Rowan Kallick. Great, mate.